the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Catherine of Stenning, pray, pray for, for us. us. St. Wilfred of York, pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So welcome to uh, this first of the uh, catechism classes. Now today really is very much um, an introduction, um, uh, so we won't be, uh, we won't need the full hour, um, I don't think. Um, and really, it's a kind of, um, uh, yeah, sort of a, a preliminary session, as it were. So the first question, uh, so the first couple of uh, domestic uh, notes first. Um, of course, as I said earlier, there are pens, pencils, and uh, notebooks there. Uh, we've got here the Penny Catechism. Again, there are copies there. Um, feel free to mark them as you'd like. Um, uh, but uh, you will notice that there are a couple of things that have already been marked um, and we're not going to hit them in today uh, but uh, they have been marked already and kind of the point that I want to make is that uh, the Penny Catechism uh, is of course um, uh, a Roman Catholic publication and what I've marked in your copies already is what is new to the faith uh, that Rome introduced in the last couple of hundred years. This is not the Tridentine Catechism, which um, uh, is one of our official catechisms. Um, and it's not the Tridentine Catechism, and you will find it difficult. Anything that says it's a Tridentine Catechism that has the things in it that I've marked, I've actually put a big black cross through, um, is not actually the Tridentine Catechism. It can't be, because the things marked off in here uh, were unknown to the Council Fathers at Trent. Um, now, as you know, we are old Roman Catholics. We are Western Orthodox, but we are formally known as old Roman Catholics because we hold to the old Catholic faith. That is, the faith as it was up until the year 1854 AD uh, as expressed um, in the uh, Western Catholicate of Christ Christendom, we might say. So there may be other things as well um, that we go through where uh, we may need a discussion, shall we say, uh, about uh, uh, the um, orthodox, the more orthodox interpretation or perspective. Um, but I wanted to point that out, that you know we, we use this because otherwise it's actually a very good little book. Um, I have an affection for it because I learnt the faith uh, through it uh, uh, when I was a child. Um, unlike for yourselves though, I'm not going to ask you to memorise the questions and answers as we had to do as children, <laughs> but I would commend you and certainly recommend um, reading it often and perhaps you know taking to heart uh, some of the answers, particularly those which are um, most pertinent to yourself that perhaps um, you occasionally uh, struggle with or have doubt about, um, but also too those answers that may answer questions that you often receive about the faith. So that these catechism classes, as, as much as they are um, uh, consolidating uh, our understanding of the Christian faith, just sort of going over the basics and, and bedding them in as it were, um, 
but also two is something perhaps of an apologetics class um, because many of the answers uh, that we will go through should um, help you in fulfilling the divine commission that we all as baptized Christians are charged with to proclaim the gospel. Um, some of course uh, might say that uh, these the answers given here are uh, simplistic, uh, indeed in some ways they are, um, and where there is opportunity to, I may allow conversation and discussion uh, to delve a little more deeply uh, into some of the subjects, but I will be always conscious of time. Um, uh, and certainly there is no reason why uh, after this course and later in the year we couldn't pick up uh, some of those questions uh, that, you, that might come up uh, in the course of, this, of these classes. And just speaking of time, what I will do is grab my little carriage clock. So that I keep my promise to stay on time. <laughs> So, and uh, question for you, so, because this, uh, I mentioned this in a homily uh, recently, um, why am I sitting down? Because the uh, father sat to teach their group, they always sat at the front, not stood and preached but sat and both preach, pre preached yes yeah. and taught that's right Is in that ancient right? times yeah mm. in ancient times um, rabbis teachers masters apostles um, sat to teach which is why uh, the bishop's chair the cathedra um, is always given pro you know prominent place uh, in our churches um, so it's a uh, yeah it's a it's a sign of authority. You may remember Jesus mm. mentions uh, uh, the um, priests and the Pharisees sitting in the chair of Moses yeah. um, and saying that they have authority to teach because they sit in the place of Moses, they sit in the chair of Moses. So it's, um, yeah, so it's a, a demonstration of, of the authority that the church has given me as a contemporary apostle um, to teach. Cool. Next question. What is faith? I'll give you a clue. You must have it for you to be here. It's a belief, a trusting in God, but it's something that can't be um, measured or seen. It's, it's something between it's ourselves and God. Us. It's a, it's a true belief that he is within us and yeah. we are in him. Yeah. Essentially, the difference, is, what would you say is the, the difference between faith and knowledge? Knowledge can be tested, but faith, it proves itself, but it can't be tested in man's way. It's more test, tested in God's way. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. That's, that's basically it. Knowledge, of course, and then we rely on knowledge. We're bid to use our brains, as I often say to seminarians. God gave us a brain, use it. Um, we are meant to employ uh, our brains, and we are certainly meant to increase our knowledge. Um, but knowledge is something that is um, tangible, as it were. Mm. It's kind of quantifiable, or as mm. you say, measurable. Um, a, a fact is a fact. Yeah. Um, uh, Although these days people often query and question that, but generally speaking, a fact is a fact. Whereas um, faith um, is uh, a trusting um, uh, in something that perhaps is not immediately obvious or discernible, 
in the ordinary way that we understand knowledge or that we have knowledge of things. Um, it's an inherent thing of faith, is it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the scriptures um, say that faith is a gift from God. Yeah. Um, but of course, can you think of other ways in which people express faith? So I'm not talking uh, about other religions, per se, but other ways in which people manifest faith. By their actions. Mm. By following the words of Jesus and feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick. Okay, so what, what I'm getting at here is yeah. that often people criticise people of faith because they say, they think they can say, oh, well, it's, you know, well, you, it's all in your head or uh, you just trust in it. Um, but there are other areas of life in which people manifest faith, though not necessarily faith directly toward God, but they manifest faith. For example, unless you are a expert combustion engineer, every time when you sit in the car and turn the key and the ignition, <laughs> you, yeah. you are, you're expressing faith, your expectation is that the car will turn on. Yeah. You express faith as you approach traffic lights too. You have faith that the people are going to, to, to obey the red light. Yeah. When you take off at, at green. Yeah. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which um, uh, people manifest faith. Um, for example, St Cyril says of faith, it is not only amongst us who hear the name of Christ that faith is made so great a thing, but everything which is done in the world, even by men who are un unconnected with the church, is done by faith. Agriculture is founded on faith, for no one who did not believe that he should gather in the increase of the fruits of the earth would undertake the labour of husbandry. Mariners are guided by faith when they entrust their fate to a slight plank and prefer the agitation of the unstable waters to the more stable element of the earth. They give themselves up to uncertain expectations and retain from themselves nothing but faith to which they trust more than to any anchors. Yeah, um, yeah so, so it's, it's something to, you know, that's, I mean, if you can remember that quote from Cyril, it's brilliant, but, um, uh, people manifest faith in all sorts of ways other than yeah. as, as, as necessarily religiously. Yes. Scientists also, of course, manifest faith. Uh, they're manifesting faith that their theories uh, are correct. Yeah. Um, that their uh, mathematicians, to an extent, mm. manifest faith in putting their faith in numbers, putting their faith in their uh, logical algorithms, etc., etc., um, these things are otherwise, you know, unknown. Um, maths, for example, and logic is abstract. Um, so faith is manifested um, in all sorts of ways. But religious faith, um, so, so sorry, so the point here being made um, <coughs> is that we are made, as it were, as human beings, to have faith. See, this is another area um, sometimes of um, criticism um, is that people try to suggest that um, you know we are just objects we are just a matter of um, biology that um, it's all um, sort of uh, it all happens without the need they suggest of God um, that we are kind of the logical consequence of cause and effect in terms of biology and science and chemistry and physics and so on and so forth. We are just the summation of all these things that have come together. Whereas the point is, of course, is that faith, which is something sort of abstract, mm. is nonetheless something common to the experience of humanity. That we manifest faith in all sorts of ways. And so we might say that we are created for um, now, we also
also use faith in the church to refer to, we often say, the faith. What do we mean by that? What's your understanding of that? Of the faith? What is it referring to? Well, our belief that, that's laid out in, in the um, sort of catechism of the church, the, the foundation of the church. So it's the doctrines. That's the word. I couldn't think of it. Bless yeah. you. <laughs> so the, the, the doctrines, the teachings um, yes. of the church. Um, when we refer to the apostolic faith, when we say yeah. uh, the Catholic faith, when we say um, uh, the church's faith, um, we are referring to that body of teaching, mm, yes. of, of doctrine. Now, how do we receive um, that teaching? By going to church, basically, in a, by being taken to church as a child so that you grow up within the faith. Well, you... that, that works in that particular scenario. Yeah. Um, but where, I mean, where does the notion of faith come from as a, doctor, as a body of doctrine? Surely it comes from God. Right. And how does it come to us from God? Through our ministers and priests, or by direct um, awareness of Him. Mm. No. no. Um, okay. It's um, if I say holy tradition and holy scripture. Oh, I see. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, holy scripture yes. and holy tradition uh, are the two main ways in which um, the faith is received faith is passed on. Yeah. Um, now for us as Orthodox Christians, um, what's our understanding of um, divine revelation? So thinking about um, tradition and scripture, what is our understanding about divine revelation? Where does it ultimately come from and how did we get it? Through Christ coming to us, yeah. and we find it in the Eucharist. Yeah, uh, well, so uh, we receive it from God himself, yes. made flesh, yeah. incarnate in Christ. Yeah. Um, and we receive it in scripture, and we receive it in holy tradition. So scripture, of course, who is the author of scripture? God. And which person of the Trinity? The Holy Spirit. And also Christ incarnate. No? Yes and no. So... Take so the question again. I'm obviously didn't understand. Which person of the, of the Trinity might is usually thought of as the author of Scripture? Oh, God. God. Now, which person of the Trinity? In God. The Father. Right. Jesus Christ. Or the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> All three. Thought on. <laughs> I mean, where you have one, you have the other two. <laughs> but, yeah. um, essentially Jesus. Yeah. Because who is the Word? Of course. Mm. Yes. So, the Word, so Jesus is... Um, the, uh, um, the author of, yes. of scripture so that uh, when he appears uh, in the incarnation we note for example uh, what's, the, what's the last thing we know the last event that occurs um, at the end of his childhood before uh, his, pe his preaching begins before his fasting in the wilderness his baptism The last? The last event of his early years before his public Going ministry. Going to the temple at 12. And what, was he doing in 12. The and what was he doing in the temple? Teaching and speaking with the... Um, and why were they amazed? Because of his knowledge. 
And of course, he would have that knowledge because he was because the Word. Because he was God, absolutely. Um, so, um, so Christ, of course, is is the author of divine revelation. He's the author of Scripture, mm. um, and so of course he has that intimate knowledge of Scripture because he was the author of it. Yeah. And when he is incarnate, he is the embodiment of it. So that when he says, uh, "I have not come to set the law and the prophets and the law aside." I've come to fulfill, fulfill them or yeah. to bring them to perfection. Yeah. Um, he is literally the Word yeah. made flesh. Yeah. Um, so the faith, the faith, as opposed to faith, the faith comes to us um, through divine revelation in Scripture, um, the embodiment of, of the Word made flesh in the incarnation, so the teachings of Christ Himself, yeah. given in person to whom. The apostles, yeah, Good. Uh, and uh, they in turn pass it on to us. So, as Orthodox, we understand that the, essentially there are, there are two streams <coughs> as it were, to revelation, to the way in which we receive the, the faith. Um, so we receive it in Scripture, and we receive it in, uh, as St Jude puts it, that single deposit of the faith once delivered to the saints. Uh, so that um, teaching that, uh, that was given by the word himself in person uh, to the apostles and to the disciples. So in other words, we might say we have both a written and an oral tradition. What is is any greater importance, do you think there's any greater importance between holy tradition and holy scripture? I would feel personally that holy scripture, because it's come down through the ages. Tradition is something that also has come down, but it, it's man-made rather than God-made. Okay. Uh, in the year 368, in a great council of all the bishops, yeah. what did they do? Well, of course they sorted out what was going to be put into scripture. <laughs> <laughs> they arranged the canon of yes, scripture. Of course they did. Um, so we would say as Orthodox that you, you can't really extrapolate can't the say, two. No. You can't say that scripture is more important than tradition. And likewise, you can't say that tradition is more important than scripture, but that the two come hand in hand. Um, because it is tradition that created the Bible. Yeah. When um, in the early church, there was no such thing as the New Testament. Um, no, because it Barnabas and, it, yeah, yeah, Barnabas and Matthias and Timothy, and um, they weren't walking around with nice handy copies yeah. of <laughs> the New Testament to refer to. <clears throat> All they had um, at that time um, was the Old Testament yeah. um, and uh, the body of teaching given by the Word made flesh yeah. to the apostles. So that's, that's what they had. But by the fourth century, by the time the Bible um, begins to be codified, uh, of course, that there is then, within tradition, um, uh, notable um, expositions of apostolic teaching in epistles. In other words, as you know, in the, in the letters yeah. um, of the apostles. So we have Peter's epistles, Jude, James, Paul. Uh, John, Paul. Um, and there were others. There were others. But in the Council in 368, <coughs> essentially <coughs> the process of um, uh, forming uh, the Bible was by consensus the Old Testament everyone was you know okay with we all everyone all the bishops there knew the Old Testament we had the Old Testament um, but of the epistles uh, some had some and some didn't have others 
some knew of some, and some didn't know of others. And so by consensus, they agreed which epistles were to go in and which gospels were to go into the New Testament. So in that way, we see how holy tradition is inseparable from, goes hand in hand with holy scripture. We can't say one is, is more important than the other, um, but they both come to us the same. And of course, when we uh, study the Old Testament, Old Testament archaeologists and um, theologians, they will tell you um, that the Old Testament, a very, in a very similar way, came together to, in consensus, by consensus, um, that um, the scriptures indeed began probably as an oral tradition, Genesis, um, the, the stories concerning Moses and Abraham uh, would have come down as, as, a, as an oral tradition first before they were written. Um, so I was reading a beautiful description recently of the consecration of uh, a new uh, bishop uh, according to in, in, the, in the Coptic Church and they have a wonderful moment um, where the consecrating bishop passes on the holy breath now what's what significant do you think about the holy breath, the passing on of the holy breath. Now, I have to say that in the same way, um, in, in, uh, in the same way it happens uh, in other liturgies and rites of the church, um, we don't always refer to it as the holy breath, but essentially it's the holy breath in action. But what is that, do you think, representing? What is it? What is the holy breath? It's God breathing at the beginning of creation. Now, when God breathed, what was his breath? His breath was life. And who is life? Christ. Who is the essence of life? The word. The word. Yeah. You come back, you see, coming back to the, the concept of word. Because yeah. when we speak, we speak with yes, words with, and with breath and with breath yes um, so um, this is why for example um, we believe in the Old Testament that references to wisdom are actually references to Jesus yeah um, but again we have to be sort of careful because you, you <laughs> the thing with the triune Godhead is that uh, the other two uh, persons of the Trinity are always present as well. So sometimes in Old Testament scripture, wisdom may, may obviously mean Jesus or, or can be inferred to mean Jesus. Otherwise, of course, we might think it, it refers to the Holy Spirit. Um, but, um, but essentially, uh, the, the point here is um, that the Holy Breath is that same breath um, of God. Now, when Christ Appointed the apostles. What did he do? Breathed on them. He breathed on them. He breathed on them and gave them the and power. Gave then. them the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Before gave them the Holy Christ. Spirit. Um, well, Spirit. yeah, the the active the action, as it were, of the Holy Spirit, the, yes. the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, he breathed and uh, and gave them authority. Mm -hmm. um, so. In this sense, again, is how we might understand how tradition and scripture, again, are uh, interwoven and interchangeable in the sense that um, holy breath, the word, the word, um, it's, all, it's all together combined. And uh, it is the means by which we don't just receive the faith, but indeed we receive a, a, a knowledge and understanding of life. Yeah. So if you can hold <laughs> all those um, different ideologies in your mind um, that, uh, 
that Jesus is, is the word, meaning the breath, meaning the wisdom embodied or expressed of God. So when Isaiah says, um, and, and we say in Advent, um, a wisdom that poured forth from the mouth of the Most High and created and ordered all things. Um, you can see how, how, how that is a reference to Jesus. Like the hymn breathed on the breath of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that hymn, anew. exactly. Yeah. That hymn is expressing, uh, expressing this, this knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's also the, the the way in which sacraments work. Because um, when the um, when the priest is is, um, for example, consecrating the Eucharist. Uh, it's in, in speaking the words of, inst of institution, speaking the words of consecration, uh, that yeah. the power, yeah. the life, the essence of Christ's yeah. life and breath yeah. um, make it happen. Similarly, uh, with all the sacraments in baptism, when the priest is saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Again, that breathing out. Um, and there is, of course, another part in the traditional rite of baptism, um, but the exorcism, uh, where the priest also breathes um, on the child or on the um, uh, catechumen. And again, it, it expresses expressive of this breath of life, the life, mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 essence of life, which is Christ. Um, and this is why, for example, St. James in his epistle says what he says about the tongue yeah. and about the mouth. And he says, you know, why we should really guard <laughs> what we <Yeah>. say <coughs> and think about what we yeah. say and how we use this. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it has a spiritual significance. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's something else that as Christians, sometimes we don't always appreciate um, that baptism does to us is that it we are no longer ordinary human beings by baptism we have been made citizens of heaven mm. we have been blessed and set apart and become recognized as God's children becoming God's chosen people destined for his kingdom so And in that way, we are a royal priesthood. In the way that priests, when they are consecrated, their hands are consecrated with holy oil mm. because of what, because their hands will be used to bless uh, and to consecrate things. Um, and as we reflected, I think, during Advent or before Advent, uh, when we bless objects, when we bless icons, when we bless... Mm. Uh, prayer beads, rosaries, um, whatever, um, those things are no longer ordinary. They've been set apart for and by God. But in like manner have we. And this is a fundamental thing that, that you know, if more Christians appreciated this, they might better be Christians <laughs> um, if they realised um, that their hand are set apart, they're, 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 they've been set apart for God's service. Their whole body, their whole being has been blessed and set apart by God through baptism. We have, particularly in the West, we have sort of divorced spiritual from matter. We often divorce spiritual from matter. But actually, in the faith, the faith is about the perfection together of matter and spirit. It's about the harmony that once existed in the Garden of Eden when God created uh, humankind and saw that it was good and that it had and it, it was both soul and body. It was it was together. And in Christ, of course, the new Adam we see, you know, divinity and matter 
we see creator and created harm, harm, harmoniously together and perfect. Mm. You know, Christ is, is the new Adam, is the perfect Adam. Um, and this is important for us then to understand really, for example, when we say in the creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Because again, there is something here. So traditionally, um, traditionally, Orthodox Catholics don't practice cremation, traditionally. Because there is something about um, uh, the realisation to come of the perfection of the reconciliation and restoration between body and spirit. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of rabbit holes you can go down <laughs> concerning uh, uh, how that will be, um, to which I will basically reply, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, just hope that, just do what you need to do to make sure that it'll happen. <laughs> But don't worry too much about the workings out of it. Um, but I would say that the transfiguration was a moment on Mount Tabor given to uh, Peter, James and John of a glimpse of what will one day be. That the resurrection body of Jesus was a foretaste of what might one day be um, for us. Where there, there seems to be this harmonious um, uh, interaction, this, this harmonious blending of spirit and flesh so that um, Christ could appear in rooms even though the door was locked. But he could also eat as he did in front of the disciples, fish and bread. So, it, you know, it kind of, um, here perhaps we see a glimpse mm -hmm. of of the corruption that is the fall, yeah. that it obfuscates, that it uh, um, prevents us from seeing and appreciating how things ought to be, mm. how things were, and how things will one day be, because we only see in terms of matter and flesh, mm. uh, you know, spirit and flesh. Yes. Um, whereas uh, the work that that um, Christ achieves by virtue of his passion, death and resurrection is this complete reconciliation and restoration and though we and we who become Christians and baptised are beginning that process of realising that of uh, that for ourselves of course it won't occur in this life it won't occur until the next um, but we are beginning that process um, that is why teosis the pursuit of holiness um, is is all about, and why Lent, for example, is, is a is a good demonstration or lesson about it, because in Lent we seek to mortify the flesh in order to in order that the spiritual um, in order to create a balance between the spiritual and the physical so that our flesh, so we are trying to discipline our flesh so that, so that our flesh will match our spiritual will. Yeah. Is, is, you know, is, is the ultimate purpose of, of mortification. We know what the other is, but it's all too easy to, you know, give in to sensations of, of food and give in to sensations of intimacy and so on and so forth. That's all obvious. Um, it's much less easy to do the right thing. And it's much less easy to live as God would desire us to live, which in many ways is to live on earth as we will in heaven. And there, of course, is why Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And why Jesus says, the kingdom of God is not here, not there, it's in you because it's all about this, this changing and transformation going on uh, within us. Any questions? No? Okay. 
Um, <laughs> um, Why, why do we exist? Because God created us. We are made to love him. Yeah. Now, in your penny catechisms, question two is why did God make you? The answer to which is God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be happy with him in this world and in the next. Is that what I want, should have said? No, you, but you could have said. <laughs> <laughs> but you could have said. Um, <laughs> if I wanted you to say that, there would be, there'd be little point in sitting here. We might, you know, <laughs> it's all there. But, um, <coughs> but if, if, think about, if you can, um, the conferences uh, after Epiphany um, and, in, uh, and in February. Um, what essentially, why essentially do we exist? Or to put it another way, what, what binds the Trinity in unity? Charity. Which we understand as, rather than the English word. Charity. Charity, caritas. Sacrificial love. Yeah. Um, so the what binds the three persons of the Trinity in unity is sacrificial love. Yeah. By which we mean what exactly? Sacrificial love is is a, a deeper love. It's not a sentimental wishy washy love. It means self sacrifice to help another or to give time, to give money, to give talent, to give everything to someone else through God, but because of your love for God, not for your love of self. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, essentially, sacrificial love is, um, is an unselfish love. Yeah. It's a self-giving, self-emptying. Um, it's love for the other, for the other's sake. Yeah. And never for oneself. Yeah. Now, so understanding that um, the Trinity in unity share continually um, this love, um, and you know, um, we know that God is love uh, from Scripture and tradition. God is love, and by that we mean that God, the three persons of the Trinity, are bound together in unity by charity, by this continual outpouring of self-sacrificial love uh, for one another. Why then do we exist? We exist to display that love, to, to live that love, or to try to live up to that quality of love. Yeah. So, so we might say that we are an extension of that same charity. We should try to be, yes. Yeah. But no, well, no, but we are. I see, yeah. I yeah? See. yeah? Yeah. Because such charity is, has to continually give of itself. Yeah. And so it has to have someone to give it to, so that we are made, we, we, we exist, um, for the Trinity to love us, for God to love, and by return we are called to love him and to love others. Um, but we are ourselves an extension of God's love. 
we are ourselves a manifestation of God's love. That's why he created Adam and Eve. That's why he created humanity. Jesus, of course, is, again, the embodiment of charity, the, em the embodiment of God's love. Um, and so it is that, A, he teaches us that the way we should live is through the summary of the law, mm -hmm. which is? Ten Commandments. Well, the summary of the law. The summary of the law. Two great commandments. Oh, yes. You love God and yeah. love neighbour. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's all right. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, the, so the summary of the law encapsulates Jesus the Word, God himself, made flesh, the embodiment of life and charity, mm -hmm. tells us this is how you should live. This is the right way to live, to live firstly for God. And in living for God, you will live for, neighbor. for your neighbour. Yeah. Because you, if you live in love, in, if you live in love and in union with God, you cannot help but live in love and in union with others. Mm. Because if you live in the same love that God has love for you, yeah. then of itself, you will have to love others. Yeah. You wouldn't need the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially the, the lesson from the Old Testament today. Um, yeah. What God is t saying to the Israelites then, yeah. you know, if, if, if you if you love as I love, if you live as I will you to live, um, then you will have everything and more. Um, and this, so this is in, again important because this this is explaining this is understanding why we're here, mm -hmm. why we exist, um, and why we perpetuate. As it were, God's love knows no bounds. It knows no limits. Um, uh, when God says um, uh, to the uh, Old Testament fathers, you know, go forth and multiply. And similarly, when Jesus says, go forth into all nations, yeah. teaching the gospel and baptizing in the name of the Blessed Trinity. It's this continual outpouring. But it's important for us to understand, A, that we are ourselves, we exist because we are a manifestation of God's charity. We are a manifestation of, of, of God's love. Um, so that we understand why um, we need redemption, why we need forgiveness, um, <coughs> so that we understand where it is we're heading to. So we recognise now. So why, why did, um, why now do we need redemption? Why do we need redemption? So God created humanity as a manifestation of His love, <coughs> and what happened then? Then came the fall. How did the fall come about? By disobeying God. Because? Adam. Hold on. But um, what was the gift then? The gift was of life. And? And love. And? We have one, of God. Yeah. But together with that, so, for example, we, we have it, but the angels don't. We have it... Oh, free will. Free will. Sorry, yes. Free will. The gift of free will. Yes. Now, why do we have that? Because God doesn't want puppets. We, he wants us to love him because we love him, not because we can't help loving him, because he makes us love him. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yes. <laughs> That's essentially it. It's free will. Yeah. Sin, evil, whatever came into the world primarily because of the benevolence of God. Mm -hmm. 
essentially because of the love of God being so great for us yeah. and his, his wanting us to experience that such great love yeah. that he gave us the gift of free will and it was in um, disobeying, misusing free will mm. that we, we agreed to God. That sin came into the world. That, that sin, yeah, came into the world because God asked, please don't eat yeah. the fruit of that tree. Mm. You can have everything else. I've created all of this for you. Yeah. Just that you one, can have that one. all the rest of it's yours, but just do me one favour, just don't touch yeah. that. So why is it immediately you want to go and touch that tree? <laughs> well, we would say that um, we have that now because of, uh, um, because as a result of the fall, mm. we have that, that predilection within us toward mm. sin um, and we're going to have to stop there and come back to this next week which is good because that's more or less what I was intending to do um, so um, what I suggest is reading if you would um, on this page so the second page of the catechism there's almost like a contents and for next week, if you could read part one, faith. And the numbers on the left-hand side correspond to chapters, to chapter headings in, in the body of the text itself. But if you could confine yourselves to reading part one, faith, chapters one to four. Um, for next week um, and uh, we will uh, we will begin to uh, to delve deeper more deeply into uh, the doctrine um, of the church but today as it were then was a case of sort of first principles fundamental principles um, and then next week we get more into the meat and bone of it all but saying that I would also say that today we have covered the essentials. We have covered um, who God is, who Jesus is, um, who God is as love, who we are in relation to him. And then we've just touched on when that relationship broke down. And we'll continue with that next week. 